Oh man, I've got a table, I've got an under, I'm under a thing, I'm under some stairs. Welcome to my little, um, I don't know, office. Hello and welcome to Pretend. My name is James. This is a platform for alternative and underground music and the cultures around that. We do mixes, those are cool. Uh, we do radio shows on Threads Radio. We do videos with live sessions and we do some written articles. You can find those on our website and we are Pretend Online in all the places you'd expect to find a channel like ours. This series is about live music photography. Live music photography is something that has sort of paved my way into making Pretend what it is and into various different jobs uh, around the music industry, I guess. And it is something that has literally got me into the door of a lot of places that I wouldn't have otherwise been. And I love it. And I think it's a wonderful form of art, but I find that it is very underrepresented in YouTube spaces. So I wanted to give a more definitive guide to live music photography and introduce you to some of the amazing creatives over the course of this series who I think are making waves in the UK right now. So this first video is really an introduction to live music photography and why you want to start and the equipment that will help you get there because it's not always the most expensive fancy equipment that you need to start out um, and so I'm hoping to introduce you to some cheaper ideas or things that you should be thinking about when you're looking at equipment especially when you haven't got much money to spend on it and you don't know if this is something that's going to make you money in the future. Before we really get into this I do want to say that I am I don't consider myself to be the best live music photographer. There are amazing people in the UK who I think are so much better than me from my owner Sky, Barnaby Fairley, uh, Sharon Lopez, uh, Phoebe Phoebe Fox is incredible. Uh, Sarah Oglesby, I think, is brilliant. And there are just so many people, Chris Cowley with Here and Now, that I think are brilliant. And you should go and follow their accounts if you want to be inspired by the best live music photography you can find. Um, this series is more of a journey for myself as much as it is, I hope, for you guys. So let's start by thinking about what the reasons are to start uh, taking pictures of live music. So there's loads of reasons. It's really fun for a start. That should be your core reason. But then like, once you actually start thinking, I want to be taking photos of this, it's like, well, what do I actually want to be taking photos of? Do I want to be taking photos of my friend's band? Do I want to be going to arena shows? Do I want to be documenting uh, the crowds that go to these shows? Or do I just fancy someone in the band and I want to get to know them? And that's a very legitimate reason to start. So whatever reason you have to start will influence how what equipment you want to use to start out with. Now, this is something that I really wish that I'd considered when I first started taking photos, because what you want to shoot really influences what equipment you want to use. And yeah, you'll get good results with anything because pretty much all modern cameras from your phone to a little point and shoot is incredible by historical standards. But if you really think about why is it that you want to be shooting before you start, you can save a lot of money and be getting pretty much professional results right out the dock. Right out of the dock, is that a saying? You know what I mean, right from the start, you can be looking amazing and people are like, oh my God, they're such a good photographer. Which is basically the reason for this series, isn't it? <laughs> so what should you use? People always uh, are saying like, oh, what should I buy? What should I do? And I don't think that's really the right way to look at things. Because first of all, your phone is incredible. Like some of these phones have like 0.95 apertures on their lenses which is insane and you might lose some detail but so much you can do with your phone and you can do because most of it's composition at the end of the day live music photography is particularly challenging on two fronts firstly you're shooting something that's moving very fast secondly you're trying to do that in low light and basically all a camera is is it's something that interprets the light that's given it to it so the more light you have the better the camera will do generally speaking. The way that a camera works is basically that you've got a sensor which reads a certain amount of light that comes into it and you expose that sensor for a certain amount of time, that's your shutter speed, and then you have a hole which is exposed which will be either this big or this big or something like that and that is your aperture and that is your shutter speed. The bigger that is, the less time that can be open and the same amount of light makes it in. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So the first thing to say is that your phone will be amazing for all of these different things. Uh, phones, I think my phone has a 0.95 aperture on its biggest lens, which is huge. The smaller the number, the bigger the aperture because they want to annoy you, um, which is just huge. So you could get really good results with a phone if you just put it on manual mode. Um, I'd recommend that as a really good way to start out and just work out 
if this is something you want to do because even if the photos don't come out as you want them to you can get great composition and at the end of the day best photos are always just the ones that are best composed so i've said all of that great stuff about phones i stand by it phones are amazing but there comes a point when you you really want that feel of a camera in your hands and you want to be like i'm a photographer i'm here and you don't want to spend too much money so you've got one or two routes you've got a uh, point and shoot that could be digital or it can be uh film mine was a up here uh mine was a digital point and shoot which i've taken into one too many mosh pits in its life uh so it has died a little bit but i love this thing uh, one of my favorite things about it is that it's small uh it's unobtrusive so if you're in a crowd or something you're not gonna put someone off whereas if you have a big camera that and you put it in someone's face that immediately puts them into a it puts them into a certain mind state mind state like i'm having a photo taken on me whereas something like this puts your subject at a lot more ease and i'd say is amazing for if you're looking to capture uh the mood of an event or the culture around it so if you're doing little fashion photography or something like that but yeah i really i really enjoyed this um especially for as i said getting into mosh pits and stuff like that and just having it as something portable that when i wasn't going to gigs to take photos professionally i guess it was really nice just as something that i could pop in a like small bag or put, pop on my side or something like that and it would be unobtrusive and it could wouldn't get in the way of me enjoying myself The limits of this are pretty similar to those of a phone. Uh, it doesn't do everything you'd want it to. It doesn't have as wide an aperture. It doesn't have interchangeable lenses. So that was a big one. So for me, um, there came a point when I was like, and also the video capabilities, you weren't so good. Now, while I love it to bits and I would still use it if it was not doing that, I love doing that. Anyway, if I was still, I was still using it, um, I still love this to bits, but there's something I upgraded to, and it was this. This is a Canon 750D. I worked for one summer um, during university while I was living at home, which helped me pay for the initial set of the set the the initial body for this. Um, and yeah, this thing has been what most of my professional work has been done on. Um, it's a wonderful body. It's one of those ones which, by any professional standard, doesn't hold up. It's really weird when you watch these, like, big YouTubers. They're like, oh, it's got a bit of noise. It's doing this. And I'm just like, you don't have a clue. Um, but, yeah, like, other than the autofocus, this thing was amazing and has got me so far, and I love it, to bits. Uh, the body was about £600. Could probably be about... You could probably get it for five hundred pounds secondhand now, but I think that you could go cheaper. So this is basically a DSLR with a crop sensor, and these are going to be your cheapest ones. You can get Sony ones, you can get Canon ones, which is what this is, and you can get Nikon ones and all of that. But I'd say that going with a crop sensor DSLR is a good entry point. Um, for me, I think that going back, if I had my money again, I would have bought a Rebel TI or something, which also takes interchangeable lenses and is a crop sensor camera. But the most important thing you can buy is this. This is a Canon 50mm 1.8 for APS-C, which I think is the crop sensor name. Um, this is the most important lens that you can buy as a beginner photographer. I 100% believe that. It's really versatile. And the most important thing is it's got that 1.8 aperture. The 1.8 aperture basically means you can shoot in really low light and it will look amazing, mostly. And this is about £100 as a lens, which is cheap as you go. And you can get a secondhand one for about half that price. So you could get the whole kit for 260 quid, which, you know, it's a lot of money, but it's the sort of money that you could save. Um, and you could, with that, build something that looks like a professional portfolio. And that's what matters because once you've got what looks like a professional portfolio, you can charge the same as someone who has all the equipment in the world. The thing that I found is you're just not as consistent. Other option, which is slightly more expensive, is the 35 millimeter version. Um, if you're wondering what the 50 millimeter, 35 millimeter is, it's basically the zoom length. Um, and so 35 basically means you've just got a bit more space to look around. Uh, at the context so in some ways 35 mil is better for smaller venues uh, this is just particularly good for portraits so if you're taking photos of singer songwriters or um, you're doing fashion photography 
this is amazing. So once you've built your sort of little professional portfolio with your little Canon Rebel or whatever cheap for camera you're using and your little 50 mil or 35 mil, that cheap setup, the next thing you should do is invest in a second lens. And I think that second lens should be this. This is a Sigma uh, 18 to 35 1.8 millimeter. And for it to have a zoom and that wide an aperture for the price that it's at is amazing. Now it's not cheap, it is 650 pounds which is obscene amount of money to buy new. Um, you can obviously get it cheaper secondhand. Uh, I went to university and the university I went to had a business su startup support scheme and I wrote them a business plan and they gave me a thousand pound grant, which I put towards starting Pretend. Um, and that was a really useful thing. So one of the things I'd recommend is once you're at the point where you've got a bit of a professional portfolio, Look around for opportunities that are open to use, things like Youth Music, Arts Council, England. Um, I'm sure photography societies have different ones, but you'd be surprised the kind of money that you might be able to find floating about. Um, but yeah, this one was a result of um, university and writing the business plan that allowed me to do that. And it was a really good investment. Uh, it does really well. It's also incredible for video. Um, that's something else you should always consider at these points. Most cameras can do 1080p at 25p and you should always be thinking about video because even if it's not something you're passionate about, it's a really useful skill to have. And it means that, you know, someone can ask you for uh, a video at the end of it all as well. One of the things that I found most useful is actually just doing a one minute of live footage that's really high quality. People love that. It goes down great on social media. Um, but no, this was the second, um, this is what I recommend your second purchase should be, the Sigma 18-35 1.8. Now the other thing you should probably look into getting is a external flash because the biggest problem with live music photography is there's not enough light, so why not just add some? I only did this a few months ago and genuinely it changed my photography completely. Um, you wanna be careful when you're using a flash in a live music setting because you are there for the show. The show is not there for you. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not impacting the artists or the audience's experience because that's the most important thing. If you're a photographer who is annoying the audience, you're not going to last very long and you're not adding to the experience. And that's the most important thing for me is that I love live music as a form of escapism. And sometimes a photographer being there will take me out of that. And it's something that I get quite worried about when I'm at shows. So it's really important that, especially when you're using a flash, that you're conscious of the audience. That said, it does make your photos look a lot better for not very much money. So this was my first flash. It is a Canon Speedlight 540EZ. It is secondhand from Nichols Cameras in Camden. And I really recommend going in and talking to the people who run camera shops because they will more, know more about cameras than anyone else in the world. And um, yeah, in particular independent shops and they'll help you and they will look to support you and not try and steal you out of loads of money. Anyway, this thing's great. It's better than um, your on-camera flash, which I'm going to try and bring up. So the problem with an on-camera flash is that it only ever shoots forward. I got it the wrong way around. Uh, it only ever shoots forward, which basically gives you a really cool punk aesthetic. A girl called Dana Katz does this really well. Piran Aston in Manchester is amazing at this. Um, but the way that I intend to use a flash is I point it up at the ceiling. Um, so that means that it basically bounces off the ceiling and falls down on their head and gives a nice sort of diffused look to uh, the light that falls on people and basically washes out colors a bit less. Um, but yeah, the other good thing about an on-camera flash is you can affect the, you can control how much power uh, the flash is doing. Whereas in one of these, it's just one speed, baby. Uh, and that can kind of blow out photos in quite a grim way. I would say that once you have decided that you want to do photography, you've played around with point and shoots a bit and you've decided, yeah, this is something that I like and I want to take photos of music. No matter what you're taking photos of, I think that these four things will basically cover you to up to a professional level. And I'll get on to why I've upgraded now after this. But yeah, camera body, crop sensor, 50 mil, uh, 1.8 lens. All the manufacturers have one of these. A flash, 
external flash, really unbelievably useful um, and will elevate your photos to look amazing. So this and a kit, these two and a kit lens, which is your 18 to 55 thing that comes in the box, will do you amazingly for most of what you do. Then Sigma 18 to 35 1.8 really think that is an incredible uh, piece of equipment. And then, yeah, just go out and shoot loads. All of that should probably come to around a thousand, between a thousand to one thousand five hundred pounds, which is a lot of money. But if you think about the fact that you can charge a hundred pounds a shoot, you can make it back in 10 shoots. And that isn't a bad return, especially because you're doing something that you probably enjoy and you're meeting amazing people along the way. Now we've got to the point where I'm going to say that I bought a very expensive camera recently. Now, what are the reasons for that? Well, the reasons for that is that as a f photographer, you are a storyteller. And when you're telling your own story, you can tell that story in whatever way you see fit. And the equipment that you use doesn't hold you back in doing that. It helps you create a style in which you tell a story. The problem I've come up against is that I have done shoots. Uh, in particular, there was a shoot I did at Printworks which, you know, I did it in my style, I did it my thing, and the client I was working for just wasn't happy with it. And the thing that I realized is they were looking for something that looked like different to what I wanted, and a more expensive piece of equipment basically allowed me to tell, would have allowed me to tell that story in the way they wanted to. So I was no longer telling my own story, I was somehow suddenly telling someone else's story, and that was what they were paying me to do. And so that's why I invested in a new camera. That was a Canon R6 with a big, fat, juicy lens on it. And I felt like the amount that I was earning from things justified that. But I would say that that is after two years of photography being quite a big source of income for me that I've decided to make that call. And once you get into that point, then you might as well just watch one of the professional YouTubers um, who knows all about that kind of thing. Anyway, um, yeah, I, that's, I've loved it on the couple of shoots that I've done. Obviously, pandemic-wise, hasn't been the best year to do it, but it has meant I've got to get used to the camera before. I've obviously given you loads of like specific examples of things you can buy and all of that sort of thing, but it's more important to think about um, the characteristics that these things all have. So starting off with the camera body, um, you want to go full frame when you can. Um, like a secondhand 5D or something like that, because basically it means that there's more sensor for light to hit. But crop sensors are amazing, especially by historical standards. Like people were taking amazing live photos in the 80s, and now you can do it for heart, like a fraction of the price. So when you're looking at things, don't be put off by if it's a crop sensor or full frame, because full frame is just so much more expensive. The other thing to consider with a camera is its video capabilities. Um, you never know when you're going to need a video it's really useful to be able to do something good. Uh, Canon is really rubbish at the lower end for doing a for doing anything in slow motion. So that would be anything that's like 60 frames or anything like 60 frames a second. Canon doesn't really do that at 1080p, whereas Sony and Nikon both do. So you want to be aware of that if you're buying it. But to be honest, you can get professional work and do no slow motion. You just make it your style and everyone's cool with that mostly. Moving on to lenses. Uh, lenses are far more important for live music photography than the camera body, which is why I'm selling you to, you know, get a £200 secondhand um, crop sensor body if you can, and then put your money into lenses. Um, mostly look for a wide aperture. Uh, that means something that's 1.8 or lower if possible, but there's nothing cheap uh, below 1.8. And most of those cheap lenses are 50mm or 35mm. Um, and they're really cheap secondhand as well. So just look out for those. And I think that is probably the most important single factor that will take your live music photography from being something that is blurry and grainy into something that is swish and professional. Well, I hope that from this video, you've got a sense of why you'd want to shoot live music and some of the things that you might want uh, to get if you're going to start. I really, really can't stress enough that I've been through you know, get flash and get a big camera, all of that. But I can't stress enough that just going in with a phone, putting it on manual mode and getting great compositions will take you so far and really help you not waste your money when you get to a point when you're going to put money into this because these things aren't cheap. 
thank you very much for watching this video. It's really, really appreciated. Uh, please give it a like if you did like it. Uh, please don't give it a dislike if you don't like it. And if you didn't like it, why are you still here? Uh, give us a subscribe because this is gonna be a series that we're doing. The next video, we'll be looking at the settings that you can use when you're at the gig. And after that, we'll look at the way to act at a gig and how to get into a gig and sort of more the social aspects of being a live music photographer. And then after that, I hope to introduce you to some of my favourite photographers and video makers and designers uh, working around the UK music scene today. This has been Pretend. You can find us at Pretend Online on all of the socials you'd expect to find a thing like us. We do radio shows and all of that. So please make sure you find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok uh, and have a good time. My name's James. You can find me at Jamie Random. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you. So, you know, shoot me a line. Is that a thing people say still? I don't know. Shoot me a line. Anyway, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you. We'll be back in the next video uh, with more things and I hope you enjoyed this.